right, a blessed Sabbath to you all. I trust you're able to hear me. Um, uh, am, I, am I audible enough? Is that all right? Okay, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So glory be to God for this privilege to be able to share. Um, I thank my brethren for the kind words, completely unworthy. I am truly an unworthy and an unprofitable servant. Just thank the Lord for the honor he bestows upon me, which I know I am not worthy of to be able to speak his word and share him with others. So glory be to his name. Let us just bow our heads as we pray and uh, get into the word of God. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for blessing us with the privilege of the Sabbath day. It is a day, the prophet tells us, in which you draw closer to your people more than any other. A day when, O oh Lord God, you want to pour out your rich abundance. It is a day of fruitfulness. It is a day of gladness. A day which is not just the promise of holiness, but the promise of the holy presence of our God. So we thank you, Father, once again for ushering us into this palace uh, in time, gathering us, inviting us, getting us together to see your face and rejoice in your love. Thank you once again, Father, for opening the portals of heaven and the welcoming arms to invite us away from the treacherous nature of this life to come into the sacred, rejuvenating, renewing presence of our Savior. Glory be to your name, Father, for you alone are worthy of it. Thank you for the word you have prepared for us. May you minister to your people on your day through your word. May you be lifted up, Father. Cleanse our hearts, please. Sanctify us, purify us, please, that nothing may taint the appreciation and the, and the exaltation of our God. May you forever be praised. We praise thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you once again, friends, for joining us. It is a blessing to be able to worship together. Uh, our subject today is entitled, A Strange Act. A Strange Act. We will get to that in just a bit. To lay a foundation stone, we would like to talk about, friends, the, the very uncertain times we're living in and how clear these times point us to the end of time, to the near coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself tells us that when you see these signs pass, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. And indeed, we're living in those very, very significant times. It used to be back in the days when even through the medium of Hollywood, you would have these subliminal messages, the, these subtle hidden agendas that would come forth portrayed in the different movies that were released from, from the medium of Hollywood. But recently, friends, Hollywood itself also has pulled back the curtains and allowed us to see really the dark nature of that which is soon going to come upon God's people. Why do I say that? Recently, a, a movie was released by Hollywood entitled The Tomorrow War. The Tomorrow War. I do not encourage anyone to see it. But I'd like you to listen to the storyline of this movie. The Tomorrow War is set in the year 2022, which is next year. It's set in the year 2022. The Football World Cup is happening in Qatar. And while the world is watching this, this, this World Cup unfold, uh, right on the football pitch, right on the football pitch, a, a time travel portal opens up. And soldiers walk out of this time travel portal. This is in the movie. Now, as these soldiers come out, they have come to warn the earth. These are human soldiers from the future who have come to 2022. And they've come to warn the world that the world has to fight a war in the future. Hence the title, The Tomorrow War. There's a war they have to fight in the future. And if they don't fight this war, earth is going to be destroyed as we know it. And so the movie portrays how world governments unite, how world governments come together and they are gathering together, not just soldiers, but they're enlisting different people to go out into this war in the future. So a time travel portal is also built on this side of 2022, sending people, sending these forces to go fight uh, this war into the future. Now that's the storyline. But this is where it really, really gets interesting. The part where it gets interesting, friends, is that humans are to unite. They've come together. World powers have come together. 
to fight against actually an alien race. There are these aliens that have invaded the earth and they have to fight these aliens. Now, of course, that sounds like a sort of a very well-known storyline and you're saying that's nothing odd, nothing strange about that, nothing striking about it. But this is where you begin to see the change. What's peculiar about this alien race they are fighting against is that this alien race is a Sabbath-keeping race. Let me say that again if you didn't catch that. Let me repeat that again. The alien race were the all different nations are uniting together to fight against. This alien race is a Sabbath-keeping race. Every Sabbath, the aliens just disappear. And at the after the end of the Sabbath, the aliens come back to attack the earth. So the world empires have come together to fight against a race that keeps the Sabbath. And the plot is that if we don't kill these aliens, they will destroy the earth. So we have to destroy the Sabbath-keeping race before they destroy the earth. That's the storyline. Now it may sound like something you've heard before. Now it may sound like perhaps a sermon you've heard before or a book you've read before speaking about the great controversy we're a part of and how it comes to that very tragic the tragic experience for God's people, but a glorious end at the end of it all. Interestingly, in the movie itself, I mean, the prophetic imagery is so strong that the human entities that have come together to fight, this human side is being led by an individual, and this individual is a woman. So notice this, a woman is at the head of fighting this Sabbath-keeping race. So a woman is leading this. If you if your if your prophetic antennas are spiking, you probably see where this is going. So a woman is at the head of this world collaboration amalgamation to go fight against the Sabbath keeping race. Interestingly, the Sabbath keeping race also has a woman at its head. They have a they have an alien queen, and everyone seems to be all the aliens seem to be protecting this woman. And interestingly, in the movie, the woman the human woman is going to attack the alien woman and actually takes this alien woman into captivity i mean the imagery is just undeniable our revelation 12 god presents his church as a woman revelation 17 the devil presents his woman as uh, his church as the woman and how it's a battle of the two women women in in the bible revelation 12 and 17 and here in this movie it is portrayed as well and it's just fascinating fascinating what even the secular medium is telling us and interestingly the time when world the world is called to come together to fight against a sabbath keeping race is taking place in 2022 so passing out no prophecy here friends but very interesting to note the timeline they set in the movie to call people together to go fight against a sabbath keeping people so very, very interesting times ahead of us, friends. And it is simply an invitation to get to know the Lord like we've never known him before. To really begin to cherish him, to really begin to prepare like we've really not prepared in the past. For God is indeed inviting a people to be found standing at his coming, found standing at the end of time. With respect to that, we'd like to go to our message and particularly to the book of Isaiah. Let us just pray one more time as we go into God's word. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for the ministration of your word and the ministration of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, for that which you have in store for us, the subject you've prepared to deliver to us, the lives you seek to change. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will possess us afresh as we recognize how far short we have fallen from the glory of God. May your name be lifted up. We praise thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, friends, turn with me to the book of Isaiah. And we want to begin with the first chapter. Isaiah is a glorious book. And this book, and much of Scripture, in fact, is speaking to us. If you really pay close attention, much of Scripture is dedicated to the subject of the shaking and the latter rain. Much of scripture speaks about that. Much of scripture seeks to prepare the people of this world for the soon coming shaking and the latter rain that God is longing to pour upon his people. 
Isaiah also is a book that speaks abundantly upon the subject. But notice, in fact, how the book of Isaiah begins. Isaiah 1, if you unpack it, is actually a covenant lawsuit that God is presenting. God is presenting a covenant lawsuit against Israel, the people of God who have forsaken the Lord and walked away. So God presents this covenant lawsuit right here in the book of Isaiah, starting in chapter 1. In fact, if you look at, the, look at even the imagery of the words that is used, gives us that very clear impression. For instance, Isaiah 1 verse 2, God says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. And that's strange. Usually when God is speaking to Israel, God would just speak to Israel and speak about their sins and speak about their brokenness. Isaiah 1 verse 2 starts off strangely, though. God is inviting the heavens and the earth to bear witness. This is a proper lawsuit setting where God is calling for witness to witness the accusations that God is going to present against Israel as a breach of the covenant that God had made with them in Exodus 19. So here it begins, the accusations in verse 2. God says, I have nourished and brought up children. They have rebelled against me. Verse 3, the ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know my people, do not consider. It's a fascinating choice of word. God says, the ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. God is not saying that they don't know about me intellectually. The word used in the Hebrew is the word yada, which also means to know intimately. The first time that word is employed in scripture, know, is found in Genesis 4.1 when the Bible says, an Adam knew Eve and a child was born. So it's fascinating the intimacy that God is describing here. My people know intellectually about me, but they don't have a knowing, salvific, intimate relationship with me. That's the accusation. In fact, verse 3 is terrible because God is saying animals are behaving better than Israel. Israel's behaving worse than animals. That's the condition. And, and put yourself in Isaiah's shoes and picture yourself presenting your opening message to God's people. And it's not a message of really an encouragement to begin with. The opening statements are that of ridicule. The opening statements are that of deep condemnation, it seems. But let's keep reading verse 4. God says, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they've forsaken the Lord. They've provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Verses 2 through 4, God presents the accusations against Israel as a breach of the covenant, the marriage covenant God had sealed with Israel in Exodus 19. Interestingly, we're not going to get into it, but interestingly, verse 5 onwards, God begins to pronounce certain experiences Israel is going through. God says, why, for instance, in verse 5, God says, why should you be stricken anymore? Why would you revolt more and more? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Now, we don't have time to get into it, but verse 5 onwards, God is presenting evidence of the fact that Israel has indeed broken the, the marriage covenant. And the evidence is presented in the form of the words God employs. Why do why you be stricken? Uh, verse say 5 goes on to say, your whole head is sick. These two words are actually part of the covenant curses God had pronounced in Deuteronomy 28. In Deuteronomy 28, God had said, if you breach this covenant, these curses would come upon you. And the same words in the Hebrew employed for the word stricken, the word for sick, and later on for other words in verse 6, the word bruises, the word sores, all of these are the in, the, in the, in fact, even in the Hebrew, these are the curses God had said Israel would invoke if they breached my covenant. And in Isaiah 1, God is presenting evidence. Look, I can prove they've breached the covenant because they're already experiencing the curses. So Isaiah 1 begins on the heels of God presenting an accusation. It's a covenant lawsuit. And with an accusation, God's also presenting an evidence. God is saying, I can prove the fact that they have indeed breached the covenant. All of this is taking place when all of a sudden you hear the words. I mean, it's rough. It's, it's a very, very dark picture painted for Israel. But even after saying Israel's behaving worse than animals, I'm going to read to you a text that you know so well, but perhaps out of its context, it doesn't mean as much as it means within its context. 
the conduct is this covenant lawsuit, God presenting these, these accusations and the evidence that they have breached the covenant. In this light, God says in verse 18 of Isaiah 1, Isaiah 1, 18, the Lord says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It's amazing. No one speaks like this. No one loves us like this but God. Who says, I see your darkness, I see your broken, I see you behaving worse than animals. But recognize, friends, in Isaiah 118, God is saying, I want you to come to me. I want us to reason together. When I read that, I ask myself the question, Lord, how do you expect me to reason with you? I mean, it's 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 mighty humble of God to ask my pea-sized brain to come and hold converse with God to present an argument as to why I live the way I live, as to why I am in the darkness that I am, God is saying, come, I want to hear your reasons. Reason with me. Tell me, why do you leave me and walk away? Explain to me, why does the devil seem more appealing to you? Help me understand this. And it's like, God, wait, you're expecting me to give you a reason, a justifiable reason for my sin, Lord, that? How can I hold an argument, Allah? How can I present an argument against you, proving that I'm right and you're wrong? And yet, God says, hey, I just want to hear you out. Tell me why is it that you keep walking away from me? Recognize, friends, the way God speaks, worse than animals. You're behaving worse than animals. Understand then that it's not just a tone of condemnation. It is a tone of realization. It is a tone that God takes and speaks the way he speaks to let us know who we really are so that we can sense our real need of the Lord. Friends, recognize, friends, God is not, the Bible tells us in John, in, in John chapter 3, that God has not come to judge and destroy the earth, but to save the world. And so the way he speaks is not because he's speaking in utter condemnation, waiting to, 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 to take you out at the, at the drop of a hat, but rather the scripture tells us the way he speaks is the way he speaks. Because he wants you to know who you really are so that you may truly sense your need for God in your life. Isaiah 118 is an evidence of that. In one breath saying you're worse than animals, and yet in the other breath he says, come, I want you to reason with me. Help me understand. It, 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 is, it is just amazing. It is just amazing. And he's saying, I mean, by the way, Isaiah 1 connects further on with Isaiah 53, speaking about the Messiah to come. Because your God is saying, I can turn all of this. Though they be scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they'll be like crimson, they'll be like wool. And you're saying, Lord, how can you just change all of this? We're even experiencing the curses. How can you say you're just going to take it out? Can it really be? Can it really be done that way? But if the law could just be done away, if the sin could just be done away, what was the point of Jesus dying on the cross? So surely, Lord, you're not saying that sin will just be forgotten like that. Surely you're going to deal with it. How are you going to do it, though? Where are you even tasting the curses? How are you going to change it? And if you read Isaiah 53, the very words we picked up on earlier, which were covenant curses from Deuteronomy 28, those very curses, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, will come on the Messiah. The way God deals with our sins and the curses we've invoked is by placing them upon the Messiah. I mean, it is a beautiful story of redemption. I'd like you to really pay attention to. But it is in this line that God is still speaking to Israel when we come to Isaiah 28. And in Isaiah 28, we find a deeper revelation of what God would like his people to appreciate. So come with me, Isaiah 28, and it begins in verse 1. And again, God starting off, and you'll see sort of see this pattern in Isaiah 1, the same pattern you'll see in Isaiah 28. God says, woe to the crown of pride, Isaiah 28, verse 1. Woe to the crown of pride, woe to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Again, it's a devastating picture, and God's not speaking to a pagan nation. God is speaking to Ephraim. God is speaking to his own people. And when God speaks to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, there's no doubt that God is speaking here about Samaria. Samaria was a city on a hill. Surrounded by this lush valley, Samaria sat on a hill like, like a crown. 
And God was saying to his own people, this place, this beautiful city, Ephraim, or rather Samaria, this beautiful city, uh, Samaria was the capital of Ephraim. And God was saying, this city and, and its beauty has become a crown of pride for you. In fact, he speaks to his own people and he says, there are drunkards. My own people, God says, have become drunkards. Recognize, friends, God's not speaking to the world. He's speaking to his church. He's saying there are drunkards in the church. Saying their beauty is like a fading flower. Why? Why? Because the Lord says they are overcome with wine. They're overcome with wine. Lord, that can't be true. I mean, we, can, we understand this about the world. For if you read Revelation chapter 14, in the second angel's message, the second angel says in Revelation 14 verse 8, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You're saying, Lord, surely you, you, you're not including your people in all nations. God is saying, absolutely I am. He's saying there are people within my church who are overcome with the wine of Babylon. They're overcome with wine. You're saying, Lord, that, 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 that just can't be true. But what does this wine really represent? Someone asks. What does this wine really represent? Now, I'd like you to notice, friends, that the word wine is used interestingly elsewhere to help us understand what this wine is. Come with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 14. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 14. Listen to Solomon counsel his child about the ways of life. And listen to these powerful words in Proverbs 4 verse 14. The Bible says, Solomon speaking, he says, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. So notice this, Proverbs 4 14. Solomon speaking says, Enter not into the path of the wicked, Go not in the way of evil men. Why? Verse 16. He says, For they sleep not, except they have done mischief. And their sleep is taken away, unless they cause some to fall. Verse 17. For they eat the bread of wickedness, they drink the wine of violence. Oh, wait a minute. They drink the wine of violence? Interestingly, we know that, that the that the end time Babylon is indeed going to use violence against God's people. But we also recognize here, we are told uh, Solomon is counseling his child. He's saying, do not drink the wine of violence. Now, interestingly in the Hebrew, the word translated as violence here is translated differently in Deuteronomy 19. If you could go there with me real quick. Deuteronomy 19 verse 16 translates the same word which is translated as violence in proverbs 4 17 differently in deuteronomy 19 verse 16 the bible says if a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong there it is if a false witness interestingly friends the word false in deuteronomy 19 16 is the same word as violence in proverbs 4 17 Wait a minute. So the wine of falsehood, the wine of violence, and interestingly, friends, that's the falsehood. It's the false teachings of Babylon, the falsehood of Babylon that is spreading across the globe as the world is uniting and worshiping the beast, even as we near the end. But notice what scripture is appealing to us. God's, God's point is that in the last days, I am seeing that my people are getting drunk. They are getting drunk with the falsehood of the world. Sure, they've got their doctrines right. They've got their doctrines right, but they're, they are corrupted by the false ways of the world. They're corrupted by the fashions of the world. They're corrupted by the, the darkness of the world. That's what's taking place. Come back to Isaiah 28 and verse 2. The Bible says, Behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one, which has a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. God is saying God is going to bring destruction upon a people like this. Destruction is coming. Notice Isaiah 28 again is pointing us to the end of time. God is not just speaking to Israel in general. God is also speaking to the Israel of the end of time. Not just ancient Israel, but spiritual Israel. Paul encouraging us from 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11 saying that all these things were written for the admonition of those who are living at the end of the world. 
these stories, friends, are not just of value to the Old Testament church, but they're of great value to the people living at the end of the world. Notice also something interesting is God is speaking about the destruction that's coming over those who have been overcome by the falsehood of this world, by the pagan, the paganism in the world, by by the virtues of Hollywood and, 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 and the worldly music and the fashions of the world, God is saying as these things begin to corrupt my people, destruction is at hand. Notice verse 3 of Isaiah 28. The Bible says, The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. You can't help but see reverberations and deep contrast with the original intent of God's creation. In verse 3, God says, you've become a crown of pride. Interestingly, if you keep one finger in Isaiah 28 and go with me to Psalm 8, you will see a mighty contrast between the two. Psalm 8 and verse 3, notice the words of the psalmist. Psalm 8 and verse 3, the psalmist says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? What is man, Lord? that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him. Verse 5 of Psalm 8, the psalmist says, For thou hast made man, thou hast made him, a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Wait a minute. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 28 verse 3, God is saying, My people have now been wearing a crown of pride when my original intent in creating mankind was that when I crowned them with glory. Go to Exodus 33 and you recognize that when Moses asks to see God's glory, God reveals his character to Moses. God is saying, I crowned you with my character, but here you are, crowned with pride. Interestingly, if you go back to Isaiah 28, 3, God says, you will be trodden under feet. All right, you're wearing a crown of pride, so you'll be trodden under feet. When back in, Isaiah, when back in Psalm 8, and we read in verse 5, God said, I had crowned you with glory. In, in, in deep respect to that, in the very following verse, in verse 6 of Psalm 8, God says, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. When mankind was created, God says, I have put all things under your feet. And I crowned you with glory. But now that you've worn a crown of pride, when everything was supposed to be under your feet, now you will be trampled under feet. I gave you a crown of glory, you've exchanged it for a crown of pride. Everything was put under your feet, but because you've become so proud, you yourself are going to be trampled under feet. And friends, what a deep, deep introspection is the Lord's appeal from Isaiah 28 to ask us where we're really, really headed where we're really headed. Amazingly, though, we praise God in Isaiah 28, verse 5. The Bible says, In that day shall the Lord of hosts so recognize while there's destruction coming upon the wicked. Notice what God says. He says in Isaiah 28, 5, He says, In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory, for a diadem of beauty unto who? Unto the residue of his people, unto the remnant of his people. Oh, this is powerful. How this passage has these end time reflections. God is saying, even though there will be much corruption, even amidst my people, there will be those who will be corrupted, those who will be influenced, darkened, tainted by the wine of this world. There will be my faithful people who will not exchange the crown of glory for a crown of pride. They will be my people. They will be the residue of my people, the remnant. God is saying, I will bless them. But this was indeed a tragic time. While they were the faithful, let's go back to the darkness that was taking place in, amidst God's people back in ancient Israel. And also we're seeing in our present times as well, verse 7, Isaiah 28, 7, the Bible says, They also have erred through wine, through strong drink, they're out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine, they are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision, they stumble in judgment. Now, brothers and sisters, you want to pay attention, especially to my young friends who have, who have received the call to ministry. God is saying the very people, the priests and the prophets, who were supposed to teach the truth of God's word, when they themselves have been overcome by the wine of this world, what do you expect them to teach my people? 
if the very ones who I asked to stand for the truth, if they're being corrupted by the darkness of this world, what do I expect them to teach my people? As a result, in verse 8, notice what God says. He says, all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. Well, what do you expect? When you get drunk, you vomit. When you get so drunk, you vomit. And that's what's taking place. But wait a minute. God is saying all tables are full of vomit and filthiness. Well, God, what should be on these tables? You're saying the tables are full of vomit. What should the tables be full of? Well, the Bible tells us, if you go with me to the book of Exodus chapter 40. In Exodus chapter 40, as the book of Exodus comes to an end, God is setting up the tabernacle. At the, at the end of explaining from Exodus 25 onwards, giving the message in the sanctuary, how the different articles are to be put in place. In Exodus 40, God speaks to Moses and says, when you do start setting up the sanctuary, he begins to speak of the holy place. And notice what he describes about the holy place. Exodus chapter 40, 4, 0. And in verse 4, this is what the Lord says. Exodus 40, verse 4. Thou shalt bring in the table, the table of showbread, and set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. Let's read that again. Exodus 40, verse 4. The Lord says, bring in the table, the table of showbread, and set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. What was on the table of showbread? Bread. It was called the showbread because it was the bread that was seen as compared to the hidden bread, the hidden manna, which was in the Ark of the Covenant. So God says, this is the table of showbread, the bread with Jesus likened to the word of God in the book of Matthew when he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. It's amazing, friends, the purpose of the table was to be furnished with the bread, the word of God. And in Isaiah 28, God is saying tables are filled with vomit when they should have been filled, covered with my word. Hence, in Exodus 40, verse 4, God was specific. He said to Moses, Moses, bring in the table and don't just put bread. He says, set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. My question to my dear friends, is your Bible study life in order? Is the word of God in order in your life? Have you set in order the right priority for God's word in your life? Are your tables filled with the wine of the world or the power of the word? What are your tables filled with? God is saying, I, I, I don't know where to put my word because their table's already full. God can fill that which is already full. Your tables are full of vomit. But I want to put my word. Where do I put my word when tables are filled with vomit? In fact, in direct relation to that, to know that God is speaking about his word, verse 9 of Isaiah 28, right after saying your tables are full of vomit, in verse 9, God says, whom shall he teach knowledge? There it is. Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? God is saying, if your tables are filled with vomit, who will I teach the word of God? Again, especially speaking to my ministerial friends, studying the word of God deeply. God is saying, how can I teach you my word when you're possessed with wine? How will, who will I teach in a time when the church is being attacked from left, right, and center, from all points, corners, and spheres, when the church is being attacked with every wind of doctrine? Who will be the people who will receive the instruction, the understanding of sound doctrine from Scripture, not just preached from the lips, but lived out in the life? God says, where are those people? Where are those people? In fact, in verse 9, he says that the people he's going to teach, he says, are them that are weaned from the milk, that are drawn from the press. We like that text because that's what Jesus says in Matthew 21, 16, when he says, here is the, when Jesus is asked, do you hear what these say? And Jesus says to them, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou has perfected praise. Thou has perfected praise. In Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou has hid, he says, I thank thee, Father, because thou has hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Sure, they may not know the deep ends of prophecy. Sure, they may not be able to explain the Hebrew and the Greek, the syntax and the synergy, but praise be to God. These simple hearts, 
are appealed to by the Lord and they receive the instructions of the Lord and follow in the ways of the Lord. God says, I'm going to finish the work with them. In fact, the prophet points out that we will be amazed with the simplicity with which God will finish the work. We will be amazed by the simplicity with which God is going to finish the work for us. Isaiah 28, 12. We continue here as we draw to a close. Isaiah 28, 12. God is saying to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. This is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Pay attention. God is saying, I'm offering you a rest, but you would not receive it. I'm offering you the refreshing, which the prophet says refers to the latter rain. God is saying, I'm giving you out my spirit, but you are rejecting. You would not listen. Again, in direct, in direct relation, friends, to the end of time is this passage. And God says in verse 15, you think yourself comfortable because you may have, you've made a covenant with death. With hell, you say you are at agreement. But God says, when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, you think that it will not come to us because you think you have made lies your refuge and under falsehood, which we were just talking about, you think your falsehood, your knowledge of the world, your ways, the accomplishments of life will save you. But God says, no, none of this is going to save you. You're going to be destroyed. Now again, friends, just as Isaiah 1 began with God presenting these denunciations upon the way of life that Israel had espoused. Similarly, Isaiah 28 speaks about the drunkenness, the darkness, the falsehood, the wine that has overtaken his people. What's the solution, Lord? All this darkness, we get it, but what's the solution? The prophet tells us, in any discourse, in every discourse, in every message you share, the prophet admonishes us, in every message you share, there should be a portion of the message that should be dedicated to showing the people a straight path to the throne of God. In every message, that should be our agenda. So is it in God's message. While presenting the darkness, showing us the reality of who we are, God says, here's the solution. Isaiah 28, 16. Beautiful. Isaiah 28, 16, the Lord says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In the midst of such darkness, when it seems like there's no hope left for God's people, even in such utter degradation, when the very people who are called to uphold the word are overtaken by the world, what do you expect them to teach the world? In the midst of such darkness, God speaks of the remnant. In the midst of such darkness, God speaks of the babes to whom he seeks and longs and yearns to teach his word. In the midst of God says, in the midst of all of this, he says, I have a solution. If you've gone away from the Lord, if you've made a covenant with death, if you think like Israel was thinking that their falsehood is going to save them, I have an offer of salvation to you. God says, I have presented to you, I have laid a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. Come on, my friends. The same stone that the builders have rejected, it has become the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. The stone not made with hands. The stone that came and crushed the end time kingdoms in Daniel 2 and was established as an eternal kingdom. Brothers and sisters, there's still hope. In the midst of our waywardness, God is appealing to his people to look to him, to run to him, to be saved by him. For it is his desire that none be lost, but all come to repentance. I want to close with this glorious two verses. Isaiah 28 verse 21. I mean, Isaiah 28, 21, in the midst of this darkness is such an amazing, unbelievable glimpse of the heart of God. And it's truly heartwarming. Isaiah 28, 21, the Lord says, the Lord shall rise up in Mount Perazim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon. God is speaking of how he will, is going to stand in judgment and he is going to pass his judgment. He's wroth as in the valley of Gibeon that he may do his work. Listen to this. That he may do his work, Isaiah 28, 21, his strange work and bring to pass his act, his strange act. And you're saying, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. God is saying he's going to stand up in wrath. 
he's going to send his judgment, his destructive judgments upon the world because his people continuously reject him. I've presented the solution, Jesus Christ, but if you reject Jesus, destruction is coming upon you. God is going to stand up to pronounce this judgment, but the Bible says this act of judgment, as he stands up in wrath, even bringing this destructive judgment upon his people, the Bible says is a strange act for God. It's called a strange work for God. In fact, the prophet points out in the book, Darkness Before Dawn, page 43, paragraph 4, Sister White points out, Darkness Before Dawn, page 43, paragraph 4, she says, To our merciful God, the act of punishment is a strange act. That doesn't mean punishment will not come. That doesn't mean the, the destructive judgments are not coming. But it gives you a glimpse in the heart of God and lets you know that to our merciful God, the act of punishment is a strange act. Punishing feels strange to him. Hence, friends, his appeal, as we end in verse 22, his appeal to us in Isaiah 28, 22, he says, therefore, he says, because this is such a strange work for me, I don't want anyone to perish. The Bible tells us I don't take joy even in the death of the wicked. Even when the dark, devious, wicked ones die, even then I don't take joy. I don't take pride. I don't take gladness in the destruction that comes upon the world. Therefore, verse 22 of Isaiah 28, he says, be not mockers. And friends, you don't have to be an atheist to be a mocker. If you don't follow the word you know to be true, you are mocking the ways of the Lord that he has given to you, the light he has offered to you. God says, please don't be mockers. Verse 22, he says, lest your bands be made strong. The captivity that sin has put around you, the chains that the devil has put around you will become stronger. He says, do not mock my word. Do not mock my judgments. My heart goes out to you, God says. It's a strange act for me to pass out a destructive judgment. Therefore, I plead to you that do not be mockers, lest your evil will only become strong around you. The chains of sin will only get stronger around you. For the Lord says, I have heard from the Lord God of hosts, a consumption even determined upon the whole earth. Brothers and sisters, God's destructive judgments are soon coming upon the world. The prophet declares to us that in the early time of trouble, which is not the seven last plagues, but a short time just prior to it, the destructive judgments of the world will be coming specifically upon the cities, where in the book of Evangelism, page 27, the prophet says, where wickedness is in the extreme. His destructive judgments will be coming to shake the world. Friends, let us not be mockers. Let us not mock the coming judgments of the Lord. Let us get right, run to the Lord, find safety, shelter, and salvation in the chief cornerstone. I don't know where you are in your life right now. I don't know where that darkness is. And friends, even if you could tell me, I would not be able to help you the way God can help. No wonder the songwriter says, I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I plead to you, dear friends, to come to the Lord, to run to the chief cornerstone, the one who is the foundation stone, the one who's not a rolling stone, but the one who is an established cliff. He will not move. You can hold on to him and be saved. The Bible tells us we better fall on him and be broken. For you don't want to see the day when the rock falls upon you and shatters you utterly. Let us turn to the Lord, friends. Let us not be overtaken by the wine of this world, but be empowered by the power of his word. If that is indeed your desire with me today, can I invite you, if you're able, to kneel with me, please, as we pray. If you're able and accepting of this invitation, would we kneel together if you're able as we pray? Let us pray. Mighty God in heaven, what a glorious, salvific word. The Bible's amazing, Lord. It's just amazing. While many see you as a dictator in the Old Testament, Isaiah 28 denounces that and tells us that God's heart, even punishment, is a strange act for him. Hence the repeated appeals, the repeated assurances of salvation, the repeated reminders that judgment is near, that the destructive judgments of God are taking 
are going to soon come upon the world. And also the reminder, Lord, that we are indeed living in the day of judgment, in the anti-typical day of atonement. And that we, like Israel, are to fast. We, like Israel, are to weep before the Lord, are to get right with the Lord. For we are a people of judgment. Please, Father, help my friends. Take these young lives, mold them, fashion them, take possession of them, that they may be weapons, instruments in your hands for your glory. Bless them, Lord, in the various endeavors you have entasked unto them. May their hearts remain humble. May their lives stay filled with your spirit. And may their joy be full in Jesus Christ, their Savior. We give thee glory, the God of all comfort. In Jesus' name. Amen.